All right, this morning we're going to take a break from Revelation for just this week. And because it's Mother's Day, I thought we would spend some time looking at what the Bible says to mothers, about mothers, encouraging mothers, exhorting mothers. Uh, but honestly, the principles here that we will see in Proverbs 31 apply to all of us. Now, we're celebrating Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, we hopefully, I hope this is how it works, you give mom a break, you know, you do the dinner or you take her out to dinner, you let her rest, let her get caught up on her sleep or her nap or whatever, you know, give her a time to do whatever she wants. That's how we look at Mother's Day. That's not how God looks at mothers. Now, I'm not saying you don't deserve a rest, moms. Okay, you do. I, I understand life is hard. But we need to get a proper perspective of mothers because the world has created a picture of mothers, successful mothers and wives. That is not necessarily what God gives us. You know, when you think about a successful woman in our society, first of all, it starts off with a career, someone who, you know, has accomplished things in her life. She's got a degree or advanced degrees in education. She's high up in some corporation. She's done all these great things. And, you know, and maybe even has earned a lot of money, put money in the bank. And in some cases, you know, is supporting her family as a single mother, as a mother with a husband who can't work for some reason. Okay, there's lots of different reasons why, why women work. But I want us to get a biblical perspective of what God says a successful and godly mother truly is. Because, again, we can get deceived by what the world presents to us, by what Satan wants us to accept as normal. And what we see around us is not God's normal. In Proverbs 31, here's God's normal. Okay? So we're going to read this again. We're going to read the entire chapter together as we get started. And then I'm going to take just a few minutes to go through this and put it in the perspective of what does God see as a godly mother and wife. Okay, so we'll start at verse 1 in chapter 31 of Proverbs. The Bible says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, My son, uh, what my son, and what my, the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all as such, I'm sorry, of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that she, he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands unto the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, and when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. 
Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let's take a minute and pray, and then we'll look further into this proverb. Lord, thank you again for your word, for the things that you teach us in it. And Lord, even in this chapter of Proverbs about a godly mother and wife, there's advice for us all. There's principles that we all can learn. So just help us to pay attention now, Lord. I pray that your spirit would open our minds and just prepare our hearts to receive that which you want us to learn and to understand. And Lord, we just submit ourselves to the authority of your word. Teach us how you want us to live through it. And Lord, use me now as your instrument and your mouthpiece. Lord, I'm a weak human being. I'm flawed, and yet you can give me your spirit. And so I pray that you would fill me with your spirit to teach through me, to guide me, to give me wisdom that we can impart to others so that we all learn together what you want us to learn today. And Lord, we want to give you the glory. We want you to receive all the praise for today. And so we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at Proverbs 31, I want you to notice that there's two sections that this is divided up into. What we read this morning in our responsive reading was the second section. It was about the virtuous woman. But the first section here, many people kind of use as a topical reference for teaching various things. But the whole chapter is um, a unit. It is two sections, but it's a unit put together. All right? It starts by saying the words of King Lemuel, the prom prophecy that his mother taught him. So this is teachings that his son is receiving from his mother. Now, when the reference to Lemuel here, let me tell you who that is. We don't know. Okay, I, we, don't, we don't know. Okay, there has been speculation about Lemuel. Some say, well, it's a pen name that Solomon used because you see parallels in some of this to Solomon's life and some of the other Proverbs. Okay, but there's no guarantee of that. There's no proof or evidence that this is Solomon writing. So we don't know who Lemuel is. In fact, there's characteristics in the second part of this chapter that are Chaldean in nature, which means they're related to Babylon, which indicates that this, could, this, this proverb could have been written after the people were exiled into Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem. Okay, So it's much later than when Solomon lived. So we don't know if Solomon wrote this. We do know that it's included in the Proverbs as God's inspired word. And so it's worthwhile for us to learn it. Who is Lemuel? It doesn't matter. Okay, We know that he's a king. It could be some uh, uh, commentators speculate that, that Lemuel was a Gentile king uh, that was what we would call a God-fearer. He learned about the God of Israel, believed in him, and then followed him without becoming a full-fledged Jew. But he understood God's law, he understood God's principles, and he feared God. His mother was the same way. Okay, regardless of who he is, what we have here is advice and teaching that is given from a godly mother to a son. And her whole intent is to impart to him principles so that he can be the kind of man and leader that God wants him to be. Now, the first section, we have specifically advice uh, from his mother about how to be a good leader, how to be a godly leader. And that, that's the first section of advice here. Okay? And... Um, he, he breaks it down, she breaks it down into two, these two sections, if, it, if in true, if in fact, I'm sorry, that this is all advice from his mother. Again, we're not sure, but it looks like there's a continuous flow here with that break. But if we look at the two sections, first, it's how to be a godly leader. And then secondly, the advice is how to find a godly wife. You know the old saying, right? Behind every great man is a greater woman, okay? Because she needs to keep pushing him. Um, that, that may be true. Okay, I know that without my wife, I probably would be in trouble. Now, I've said that many times. I am very thankful that God gave me a wife who pushes me in the right way. And we'll see that a little bit here in Proverbs chapter 31. Okay, but first we have this section of advice that this mother gives to her son about being a good leader. Now, before we get to that, I want to point one other thing out that's just of interest. When we get to the second part about the godly wife or the godly mother, the virtuous woman, this is actually Hebrew poetry. 
It is written in such a way in Hebrew that each verse goes, starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. Just like Psalm 119, you have the sections that follow the Hebrew alphabet in order. If you read this in Hebrew, you would see that each successive verse is the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So this is Hebrew poetry. And they would see it as such. We don't because we see it in English and it's not uh, structured as poetry in our English language. But that's the way it was received by the Hebrews. Now, that doesn't mean it was just for pleasure reading. There's a lot of good substance in this. And that's what we look at it for, is the substance. So I want to start in the first section. And it starts by saying the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. So she gets his attention, first of all. And this repetition of the phrase, my son, is meant for emphasis. She wants to impart to him the fact that this is important. I need you to listen to this. So it's not just a poem. It's not just some nice suggestions. This is important. Solomon starts off the book of Proverbs the same way. Okay, in chapters 1, if you go through the first five to seven chapters, you'll see there are several places in those chapters that Solomon repeats, my son, listen, my son. And here we have the same emphasis. She's saying, listen, this is important. I'm giving important advice and principles to you as my son. So that's what verse 2 is talking about. Then she starts in verse 3 and she says, here's the principles I want you to understand. And the principles that she gives him are, are uh, three things. The first one is purity. The second one is soberness or sobriety. And the third one is compassion. She says, you need to get a hold of these principles in order to be a good leader because a good leader uses these things. You must live a pure life. You must be sober or have sobriety in your life, self-control, and then you must have compassion upon people. And she, and, it, and she breaks it down and we'll look at these verses and see this. But as we look at these verses, I want you to think about the things that kings throughout history and leaders throughout history were brought down by, okay? Immorality. We hear about that all the time. Immorality destroys leaders, especially pastors. It'll, it'll bring them down. Soberness or sobriety, and this one focuses on literally drinking or drunkenness, okay? How many people has that destroyed? And then the last one is compassion. The opposite of that just being selfishness or conceit. And we know that there's many leaders that have destroyed their countries and themselves because of that as well. And so she picks these three things to focus on that have destroyed and that have a history of destroying good leaders. And she says, focus on these because this kind of character in a man will make a good leader. So in verse 3, she says, first of all, purity, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And the reference here is to immoral relationships with women. Or, if you want to broaden that out, to the sexualization of women. And this would include things like fornication and adultery. But in a broader sense, it would include anything that comes under what we would, the Greek word in the New Testament is pornea. It means anything that is an immoral uh, sexual perversion according to God's law. If we take anything in that realm of a relationship of a man and a woman outside of God's standard for them, it becomes pornea. Okay? That's the general word. And that's the idea here that uh, she's trying to tell her son. So it includes more than just physical immorality. It includes things like pornography or even fantasizing about women. And that's why um, the Bible tells us we are to guard our thoughts. You know, again, how many men have been brought down, not because of physical immorality, but because of a, a obsession with women or an addiction to pornography or something like that? And so she warns him, purity is not just about your physical life. It's about your thought life. It's about your perception of women. It's about how you have relationships with women, specifically as a man, inside God's standard for those types of relationships. So she says, if you have the wrong kind of relationship or have the wrong perspective of women, it will literally cause you to lose your strength. You give your strength away. 
Now, it's not just strength of rulership, of leading or leadership, not just strength of ruling in your position. It's physical strength in many cases. I mean, we know that God has, I wouldn't say blessed, he's cursed the earth with certain diseases that are directly related to illicit sexual relationships. Okay? So that's part of it. You lose that health when you, do, when you engage in this. But she also says there's this self-respect. You lose self-control. You lose your example and testimony to others. You lose your standing in your community. Basically, everything's at risk here if you engage in this immoral lifestyle. And so she says you must remain pure. Now, this is an echo of a broader explanation of this from Proverbs chapter 5. And for time, I'm not going to read it to you. But in Proverbs 5, pro, uh, uh, verse verses 3 through 13, Solomon elucidates on this topic very uh, descriptively and very in-depth. And he starts, he says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as honeycomb, her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as two-edged sword. And he goes on to describe how giving in to what he calls the strange woman or connecting yourself in some way with a strange woman will literally destroy your life. It's like walking into a trap that you don't even see is there and it will destroy you. And so that's the first piece of advice that she gives her son here. Maintain purity, not just in your physical relationships, but in your thought life, in your intentions, in your perception of women as a whole, because that's what God's idea of purity is. Now, again, thinking of Solomon, uh, he had more wives than he could count and more concubines that he could keep track of. And many of them were heathen and idol worshipers, and it led him astray. If this was written by Solomon, you can see the connection. Maybe he's learned his lesson. Or maybe this was the advice the, his mother gave to him that he didn't listen to. Okay, but the point is, this is important for us to pay attention to. And she, this is a mother telling her son this. Pay attention. Find the right kind of woman. Have the right relationship with women. And maintain purity in that, in that regard. The second is in verses 4 through 7. And she focuses on sobriety or soberness here. And she says, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine. She says, it's not good if you're a leader for you to drink. Why? Verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the per judgment of any of the afflicted. Now, that's an echo. It's not a prohibition. She's telling her son, here's what I recommend. If you don't drink, then your mind will never be clouded. You will never be under the influence of alcohol that can cloud or mar your judgment. And as a leader, you need to have a clear mind. You need to be able to think clearly, to be in full capacity of your facilities as far as your mental and emotional and all of your reasoning ability that God has given you to make the right choices, especially as a leader. Now, God has appointed men as leaders in their households. So there's a great principle here to follow. But we go to Ephesians, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And it's about a control thing. What am I controlled by? What am I influenced by? And that's the advice that she's giving her son. Don't be controlled or influenced by something that can cause you to exercise bad judgment. Because you're not in full control of your mental capacities. Now, it doesn't take much alcohol to throw us off. It doesn't make, take much alcohol to give us a little bit of a buzz. And all of a sudden, we're not thinking quite straight. And it's different for every person. But she says, as a king, you don't want to take the chance. And so you need to be sober. You need to approach life seriously. Not saying, well, you know, if I, if I kind of lose it for a minute, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. Because we're supposed to be in control of our mental facilities, our mental capacities. So it's a caution about alcohol specifically, especially those in authority. And, and she says in the next couple of verses, um, less, uh, verse 6, Give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish. Wine unto those that are of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Remember his misery no more. So this is more of a prescription in a medicinal sense for those people who are suffering, who are on death's door. They have no hope. 
physically, they're dying. Okay, now you go to the hospital and you're in severe pain, what do they do? They give you medicine, give you morphine or something that kills the pain. They didn't have that back then. They used alcohol to kind of ease that pain and ease that suffering. So what she's saying here is for people who are truly suffering, if people are about to die and they're going through pain, that's who this is for, let it kill their pain. But it is not for you to take alcohol just to forget about the troubles of daily life. Because we have to work through those with God's truth to come to the correct answers. And especially as a leader, we need to be able to understand God's truth and apply it correctly. And that can't happen if we're under the influence of some substance. And so she warns him here about being sober and coming to his position and fulfilling his position with soberness and sobriety, specifically in this area of alcohol. Then she moves on to verse 8 and 9. She says, you need to have compassion. She says, open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So here his mother advises him to judge and lead with compassion. It's God's purpose for government. Remember, this is a king we're talking about. But it's God's government, purpose for government to protect those who are helpless from those who would break the law. It's the law abiders who don't need the law. The Bible tells us if you're a law abider, you don't need to worry about the law because you're already doing those things that are in the law. It's those who are law breakers that need the law because they need to be told where they're doing wrong. And the government's job then is to uphold the law to protect the innocent, those people who are obeying the law, from those people who would break the law. That's the way God ordained it. And that's what she says here. You need to have compassion on the people who are trying to do the right thing but are otherwise helpless, specifically those who have no way of protecting or helping themselves. Okay? And that's what she says. Those who uh, open thy mouth for the dumb, those who can't speak on behalf of themselves, in the cause of all as such as are appointed to destruction. That word appointed to destruction literally is interpreted the sons of passing away. It means those who are in danger of being in ruin or condemned to loss of life or goods or of those who are left desolate and have no one to plead their cause. And you've, you've probably witnessed this, maybe you've experienced it in your lifetime, where you seem to be under some kind of oppression, you seem to be a guilty or, or accused of something, there's no way to defend yourself, and you can't speak for yourself. And here, she's telling her son, as the king, you need to step in and protect these kinds of people, have compassion on them, because they're the ones that need most help. Okay? In verse 9, she references the poor and needy. Please the plead the cause of the poor and needy. Again, those who are helpless and have no one to help them. Um, we could call that the fatherless children, the widows, all that are desolate and oppressed. Now, this principle is applied to Christianity in James chapter 1, verse 27, because it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So James tells us that true religion in living out Christianity as we should starts with a compassion to those who are helpless. And James specifically mentions the fatherless, the widows, orphans and widows, those who have no other recourse. They can't protect themselves. They can't provide for themselves. They can't pay you back for anything and those are the people that need our help the most. And that's exactly what the mother here tells King Lemuel. Have compassion on those people specifically. Okay? So, as we get to this section, or the end of this section, we see the kind of godly man that she wants him to be. It's about his character. It's about, not about actions. It's about his character. You need to be pure in your character. You need to have compassion in your character. You need to be sober in your character. So that you can judge rightly, so that you can lead rightly. And that's the kind of advice and teaching that a godly mother will give to her son to help him the rest of his life. And so we have an example here of the teaching that a mother gives to her son. Specifically here we have a mother teaching her son how to be a good king or how to be a good leader. But it's good for all of us. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. 
And so this training here is about pointing children in the right direction, giving them the truth they need to have and establishing the right character so that going forth they make the right decisions. And Proverbs tells us, if you do that when he is young, then when he is old, he will not depart from it. Establish the principles now so they become the substance of his life later. And so that's the first part. And that leads us to the second part. So this is not just advice about how to become a godly and righteous man. It's given from a woman who obviously is a godly and righteous woman, a godly mother and wife. If she wasn't, she would have no standing and no recourse in, 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 to be able to give this advice to her son. You know the old adage, right? What you do says more than what you say. When you tell your children, do what I say, not what I do, what are you telling them? Be a hypocrite, right? Be a hypocrite because that's what I am. Yeah, I'm telling you to do something, but I don't live that way. This mother obviously was not a hypocrite. She had a life of godly heritage that she had established already. Now she was trying to import that to her son so that he would live that same type of life. So as we get into the second section, if we want to call this her advice to him, be a godly leader, have the right kind of character as a leader, but now she's saying, find the right kind of wife. Find the right kind of woman who will be a godly wife and mother. And here, the rest of the chapter is a description of that kind of woman that he is to look for. Now, even as we, already, as we, start, this, as we start this part of the passage, we've seen the character of this godly mother and what she's teaching her children. And she's teaching both in word and example. Here's my, my premise for this, okay? When you look at children and in the teaching of children, the mother is the greatest influence that they will have in their life, especially if they're at home with their mother all the time. But the mother is the greatest influence that children will ever have because they spend so much time with them, because there is a natural connection to them as a mother. And so mothers have the greatest influence on their children of anybody else. You have that opportunity. And therefore, based on that principle, not just for the mother, but for the father as well, the mother and the father have to present a lifestyle of consistency in godly living. And I tell people, you know, as far as training children, it's all about what happens or doesn't happen at home. It's not enough to send your kids to Sunday school. It's not enough to send your kids to Christian school. It's not enough that they go to a Christian college. It's not enough that they memorize verses. The greatest teacher in their life is what happens at home. And what happens or what doesn't happen at home will form the foundation of what they will become later on in their life. And that's exactly what this woman is saying here to her son. You be the right kind of leader. She provided the right type of leadership or godliness in her life to be the example of what she's about to teach him about the kind of woman now that he needs to look for as he becomes the right kind of man. And that's, as, that's where we are in verse 10 as we embark upon this, the virtuous woman. All right. So first, I'm going to give you four characteristics that I see in this very quickly of a godly mother and wife. In verse 11 and 12, it says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil in all the days of her life. Here's the first characteristic of a godly mother and wife. She is trustworthy. A woman who is trustworthy is a godly mother and wife. The question is, can her husband and others trust her to do what is right, no matter what the circumstances or the audience? Whether she's alone, whether she's with people, is she the same person? Can her husband trust her when he goes off to work to take care of the things at home the way he would, the way they need to be? Can he trust her with the checkbook and the credit card without being supervised? Okay? That's the kind of things that are practical questions, but it all falls under this trustworthiness. And she says, this is the kind of woman you want to look for in a wife. Who is a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. Number one, she can be trusted. This is a, a woman who her husband knows 
that her whole life is dedicated to serving him and meeting his needs and then taking care of his household and his children. That's what a wife and mother is defined as, according to God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, we get into the New Testament. It says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I know some women have a problem with that word submit, and I think it's because we've perverted, in the world's terms, those, those words. The word submit does not mean that the husband gets to treat her like a slave. Okay? That's wrong. But it does mean to submit to his leadership, to submit to his authority, and to submit to his needs. Now, that command is not specifically just to women. Because you continue to read on in Ephesians chapter 5, and it says, Wives, love your husbands, even as Christ loved the church. The word love there is defined as a self-sacrificing desire to meet the needs of the one loved. And so, even in the command to love your wives, husbands still have to submit to their needs, to submit to the things that will help them in life, and to submit to their best according to God's will for them. So, on both cases, there's submission that has to happen. In fact, in 1 Peter, he tells us, let everyone submit each other to each other. We're also supposed to submit to each other. But marriage is a great practice of submission and it starts with the husband and wife. Now, if a husband and wife can't submit in their roles, the husband to God as his head, the wife to her husband as her head, how can the children ever learn to submit to the authorities or to God, even, in that respect? So the husband trusts his wife that she will fulfill her role in submission, that he will, she will do things the way that they should be done. And he doesn't have to worry about what she's going to do if he's not around. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Likewise, ye lives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Talking about an unsaved husband, a saved wife. Husband doesn't want to hear the word of God, doesn't care about the word of God. And Peter says, maybe through the life of a submissive wife, that will be the word of God that he sees and the change that God can make in someone's life and through her testimony. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, they may be converted and brought to God. Chaste conversation with fear. There's that submission to God. So part of a wife's duties is to live so that she encourages and exhorts her husband in truth, in submission. Now we have to keep that word in submission there because that's prominent for the wife's role especially. Because the wife gets to, and I'm going to give you this, this um, privilege, women, the wife gets to tell her husband where he's wrong, in love, okay? She is put there by God to remind him of where he steps off the track every now and then. That is part of her role, but she has to do it in submission and love. Okay? Not nagging and arguing. Or arguing. Nagging and arguing are just the opposite, and they will accomplish just the opposite. Sometimes the woman doesn't need to say anything to convict her husband, all she needs to do is live the right way and her husband will be convicted. And that's what 1 Peter tells us. We have the opposite of that, of women who take this privilege of telling my husband where he's wrong. And Proverbs 27 and Proverbs 25 describe that. Let me tell you what that sounds like. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. That's not positive. 25 verse 24, it is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a wide house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now remember how many women Solomon had in a large house, and he's saying, I think I'd rather go sit in a corner of the attic than be around somebody like that. So there's this principle for women, yes, your husband can trust you. Even in helping to exhort and admonish him, he can trust you to follow this principle of submission and to do what God wants you to do. Verse 12, she will do him good and not evil. 
That's her purpose in life, to serve her husband, to provide good and not evil. Everything she does is for his well-being. Everything she does is good for his reputation and his testimony. Everything she does is for his good. Not for her own good, but for his good. That's what she says here. That's the advice she gives to her son. You need a wife that's going to look out for your good, because that's what love does. Not for everything you want as a husband, but for what is best for you according to God. But she's there to serve for your good. That means she doesn't talk about him badly or criticize him, either to his face or behind his back. She doesn't treat him in a way that would degrade him or discourage him. She doesn't do anything that would bring reproach upon him or his family or his name. And that's both in the house and outside of it. She does him good and not evil. And then verse 23, when you get down there, here's the result. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. This is in public. His job, his position of leadership. And let me ask you this question. How many men, I shouldn't ask for example, I'm not going to ask for examples, and I don't want to shake your head or raise your hand, okay? But how many of you have known in your lifetime a man who goes to work and people at work go, well, he's a good man. It's too bad he has to go home to a wife like that. That destroys a person's reputation. That destroys a man's standing and his foundation even for a testimony of the gospel when his wife is out of line. And so when she says she will do him good and not evil, it includes things like that. And that's why I say, the most important thing is what happens or doesn't happen at home. A godly wife and mother is trustworthy. That's number one. Number two, verse 13. A godly wife and mother is diligent. Now, the, most of this section is dedicated to this. And I'm just going to point out a few examples quickly. Verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She seeketh. The word seeketh there means work. She takes it upon herself to put forth the effort to look for, in this case, wool and flax. And by the way, wool was warm clothing. Flax was cool clothing. So she provides for her family, both in summer and winter, to keep them warm and cool. Okay, that's the flax and wool that's here. But she looks for it. And the second part of the verse, she works willingly. Works Willingly. Now, I don't know how that applies specifically in our day of Amazon.com. Okay? Where you can sit back and click, 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 and then there it is. But if that's what you rely on to provide for your family, is a few clicks of the button and I've done my job. That's the wrong attitude. She seeks. She works willingly. There's a diligence factor here. Okay, keep going. Verse 14, she's like the merchant ship. She bringeth forth her food from afar. Now, that doesn't mean that your wife or your mother has to travel 70 miles to go get groceries. Okay? I grew up and I, know, I knew a woman. She was a coupon addict. And she literally would drive 70 miles to save 25 cents on a box of cereal because that's what was on sale at this store and she had a coupon for it. And spend $2 in gas getting there. Okay? And we go, it doesn't make sense. Okay? But it's the principle behind it. She's doing the best she can to provide for her family. And if, it has to, if she has to go 50 miles to get the best for her family, that's where she's going to go. In other words, there's no limitations on what she will do to give her family the best that they can have. Okay? We've seen their clothing. Here she does it with their food. Jump down to verse 15. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Before everyone else gets up, she's there preparing their food for them. And it's not just her family. It says she gives meat to her household. That's her family. Portion to her maidens. That's the servants. This is the mother, the, the matron of the household, providing food, fixing food before anybody else is up, including the servants. See the diligence there? 
This is a woman who does not, as Romans 12 says, mind high things or think too highly of herself. She lowers herself to help those of low estate. She's not wise in her own conceits. The servants are not there to serve her. She is there as a servant to her entire household, whoever there may be in it. That's the attitude. So it's a diligent person. It's an attitude of diligence. Go to verse 16. She considers a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she planteth a vineyard. This is talking about looking for investment. She, she surveys, looks. There's again that effort put forth. She looks and, and considers. She buys a field. Now what it doesn't say is she goes to her husband and asks for money to buy the field. We can make that assumption because sometimes we think, well, it's the husband's money. He earns the money. She's at home. She doesn't have any money. Actually, she does have money. If you jump down to verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. Where'd she get the money to buy the field? From the clothing that she made and sold on her own. But that's her money. Exactly. And she's using it to benefit her family. See, that's the attitude of a servant. That's that diligence factor. Okay? Verse 17, she girds her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. This is talking about setting a strengthening belt around her midsection. It means to get ready for some kind of difficult action or hard labor. Now, I don't know how many of you are fans of weightlifting. I never was. I've seen a few things on TV. But when these guys lift these, you know, thousand pound barbells, you'll see this big belt around their middle. Okay? That's to prevent, and I don't mean to be disgusting, but it's to prevent their insides from bursting out because this is not made to hold that much weight. And so they gird themselves about with this wide belt to support their back and midsection. That's exactly what this is talking about. She girds herself with a belt because she's about to do heavy labor. That's what the verse means. And she strengtheneth her arms. This is not bodybuilding, by the way. It's not an advocate for your wife and your mother to go, you know, start doing bodybuilding. Um, this is talking about productive activity, and through productive activity and continuous work and effort, her body remains strong. It's the opposite, would be laziness. Okay? So we have the contrast. It's someone who's diligent, not lazy. Go to verse 18. She perceiveth her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night keeps working until the work is done, no matter how long it takes. Verse 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle, her hands hold the distaff. This is talking about making cloth and thread in order to make the clothes that she provides for her family, as well as sells for some extra money to invest in her family. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. The reference here is her family all is dressed appropriately. The term for scarlet is that, okay, well, we know that you need wool clothes, so I'm going to just rip it off the sheep and throw it on you, and it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as it works, right? She dresses them appropriately, and if you want to use the word fashionably or respectfully, there's the scarlet. She takes the effort to make sure they look good as well. The diligence goes a step beyond just meeting needs. Okay? Verse 21, she's not, uh, verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. She makes clothes for herself. For herself. Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. The rejoicing in time to come means there's preparation done. There's reference in Proverbs about preparing for the future. Okay? Here we have that reference. In verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. There's that reference to laziness. Okay, so all of this, all of what we just saw here, points to a woman who is diligent. She's hardworking. She's willing to put forth the effort to provide for herself and her family, and her family always comes first. Now, one point I want to make here very quickly is that this is not talking about a woman chasing a career. Everything that's done here is within the context of the household. It does not say she goes out and works and just brings money home so that the bills can be paid and then she puts her feet up and rests and deserves for everybody else to serve her because she works hard at a job all day. This is a woman who takes care of her household. That is her first responsibility. Now, I'm not saying a woman can't have a career. 
I'm saying a wife and mother, their first responsibility is their household, their family. That's the way God ordained it. And that's the picture that we have here. A hard-working woman, diligent woman, who takes care of her house, no matter what it takes. Okay? Her job is her family. Everything is focused on providing for them. And so we have a godly woman characterized by diligence here. Thirdly, and I've got to go quickly, but thirdly, the godly wife and mother is compassionate. Look at verse 20. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. Now this is about generosity, obviously, but there's compassion here. We already saw the compassion that the mother is telling her son, you need to help those who are in need, you need to help the helpless, have compassion toward them. Here it is in action. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hand to the needy. Same words, poor and needy. And it's about not just waiting for opportunities. The stretching out her hand and reaching forth her hand means she is proactively looking for opportunities and people to help. She doesn't wait for them to come to her. She goes looking for them. She's proactive in being generous. She's proactive in trying to help people. Why? Because she has genuine compassion and love. She just told her son, you need to have compassion. Here she lives it. Now also part of this compassion is self-sacrifice. We looked at this, but look at verse 15 again. She rises also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household. She's the first one up, even when everybody else is sleeping. It's not an inconvenience for her to have to go above and beyond what everybody else is expected to do. That's sacrifice. And that only happens when you have true compassion and love. Verse 18, her candle goeth not out by night. You know, it's not the attitude of, well, I've put in a hard day's work and I didn't see anybody else doing their share, so I'm just throwing the towel in today and giving up. There's sacrifice here. And that's part of true love for other people. We're willing to sacrifice for them. That's the godly woman and wife here that, he, that she's talking about, that the Bible gives us this picture. There's no thought of herself in any of this, just service for the good of other people, even sacrificing to do it. Now go down to verse 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Now I want to put this in the context of compassion and sacrifice. You think, uh, that's kind of strange. But she makes her own clothes. Her clothing is silk and purple. The words silk and purple here are characteristic of elegant clothing. Now, does she want to be finely dressed in front of the society that she lives in? No, that's not the point. Who does she do good for? Her husband. Do you think her husband wants her to dress in rags like Cinderella? Just because she works hard? And she understands that. And so she goes to the effort of sacrificing even to make herself clothes that look nice, to keep herself nice, to please her husband. There's the aspect of compassion and sacrifice again. So we have this example that a godly mother and wife is compassionate and self-sacrificing. That's the character that is in a godly mother and wife. That's third. Number four, a godly mother and wife is wise. Number, verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Her words are marked with wisdom. That's God's truth applied. God's truth applied to everything in life. She doesn't open her mouth with sarcasm. She doesn't open her mouth with criticism. It's not anger and malice that comes forth. It's not even frustration that comes out of her mouth. It's wisdom. Wisdom based on God's truth. Why? For the purpose of edifying and love. Building up. She builds up her family. She builds up her husband. She teaches wisdom. Not just in her words, but in her life. The second part of the verse says, In her tongue is the law of kindness. Now, the word kindness there is, uh, is a word that come, means, talks about mercy. Okay? 
tenderheartedness. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we know that verse. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The word in the Greek in Ephesians is charis. It means usefulness to people. Useful in helping them become what God wants them to become. And that's done through kindness. We show kindness to people. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now remember I said that a wife has a responsibility and the privilege, in a way, of helping her husband to understand his own faults. Here's the principle in the New Testament. I and mean, this is what we're supposed to do for each other in the church. If a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore them in a spirit of meekness. You don't come to them and say, I'm more spiritual than you, and therefore I'm going to tell you where you're wrong and you need to be more like me. But how many wives do that to their husbands? How many husbands do that to their wives? In any case, it's wrong. We are to restore each other in a spirit of meekness, kindness, tenderheartedness. And at the end of Ephesians 4.32, it says we're supposed to be tenderhearted. What's the next word? forgiving one another. Now, I've done a lot of marriage counseling, and there have been a couple of times when it's just like I'm banging my head against a wall because I know the problem here is forgiveness and people are not willing to forgive. They want to hold the offenses over each other as leverage so they can hold the upper position. And that's not the law of Christ. Proverbs 26, her tongue, in her tongue is the law of kindness. And along with that comes forgiveness. Meekness. It's embedded right into it. Galatians chapter 6, I read you verses 1 and 2. Verse 10 says, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those that be of the household of faith. Doing good to people. See, there's that principle again. So her wisdom is marked by kindness, by meekness. By forgiving. That's where wisdom resides. It doesn't reside in conceit. It doesn't reside in sarcasm. It doesn't reside in anger or criticism or frustration. It resides in meekness and kindness. And that's the character that we see in a godly wife and mother. And when wisdom is the character of her living, then wisdom will be the character of her teaching that she'll be able to consistently teach her children in wisdom if she consistently lives in wisdom, in meekness and in kindness. Finally, a godly wife and mother is humble. Fourth was godly wife and mother is wise. Last, a godly wife and mother is humble. Number th verse 30, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. The word favor there, it means to put on a good show so that others will think well of you or seeking the favor and acceptance of others. What a person does and performs in public so that people will think well of you. And Proverbs says that's deceitful. You think you're gaining from it, but you're not. You think people will think well of you, but they'll see through the hypocrisy. Favor, seeking favor is deceitful. And then it says, beauty in vain is vain. Someone who spends more time working on the outside than on the inward character lives in vanity. Because the outside is just a shell. That's going to go away. Okay? If you don't believe that, I want you as married couples to go look at your wedding pictures and hold it up to the mirror and compare what you look like now to what you look like then. Okay, now I still believe my wife is the most beautiful woman I ever saw. Okay, but the beauty is on the inside. Now I'm not saying she's ugly on the outside, okay? I'm not going to go there. Okay, that's, that's what I see when I look in the mirror. Okay, she's a beautiful woman all the way around. But the principle is real beauty is inside. Okay, if you spend all your time on the outward performance, you're wasting your time. And a godly woman understands this.
It's not about the outward appearance. It's not about being fashionable. It's not about having the makeup perfect all the time. It's not about presenting a perfect picture to everybody else. Now, she's concerned about her husband and how she presents herself to him and how she represents him to others, but it's not about vain conceit for herself. Okay? And then she says, it's about fearing God. The real issue is fearing God. Do you care more about what God sees in you than what others see in you? Do you do all things for the praise of the Lord and not for the praise of men? Okay, that's that humility. Remember, humility is defined by having the same mind as Christ in Philippians chapter 2. He made of himself of no reputation. In other words, he didn't defend his reputation. People accused him of being a sinner, of eating with sinners, of eating with for, uh, fornicators and prostitutes. And he did. Why? Because he needed to minister to the lost and, and unsaved people. And that's where he found them. He didn't become like them, but he ministered to them. But he didn't care about what people thought about him. I, honestly, the, the Pharisees created this awful reputation of Christ. It didn't matter to him. He wasn't there to defend himself. He was there to, to fulfill God's purpose for him. So he didn't have a reputation. He became a servant. We've seen that already in this picture of the godly woman, a godly mother and wife. He became a servant. He sacrificed himself for others. And he did it not for what he would gain out of it, but he did it because that's what pleased his father. And the same attitude is in a godly mother and wife. She does it because that's what pleases her father. Everything she does is in the fear of the Lord. Not for an outward appearance, but for what God will see in her. We sang this song, The Father Looks on Me, this morning. Okay? The third verse references the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you know, he takes his father's inheritance, he goes out and he wastes it, and then when he gets totally destitute, he says, I want to come back. And he thinks in his mind, if I crawl back and just ask my father if I could be a servant. That's all. I just want to be a servant. At least I'll have somewhere to stay and something to eat. It's better than feeding pigs and eating pig food. And when he goes back to his father, his father sees him coming and runs to him with open arms. And he came back to his father pleading just to be accepted as a slave. And his father didn't just bring him back as a son, but he exalted him as a son. Killed the fatted calf, put on him the best robe, had a big party in his favor. That's the picture of salvation. When we come to God, we come to him with an attitude, I don't even deserve to be your servant, but that's all I can ask. And God accepts us as his son. And we're exalted by him. But there's the attitude that's talked about here, about the fear of the Lord. She does everything with this attitude of a servanthood, not even being worthy to be a servant, but that's what God's called me to, so I'll do the best I can with his help. And God exalts her. What's the reward? Her children rise up and call her blessed. Verse 28, her husband also, he praiseth her. Verse 29, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Give her the fruit of her hands. In verse 31, let her own works praise her in the gates. God will exalt godly women. God will reward them with rewards much better, much more valuable than anything you could gain on this earth. Than anything you could gain by having a great career. By anything you can gain by living for yourself and trying to accumulate or, or achieve things on your own and for your own purpose. God exalts godly women. And he says, many daughters, verse 29, many daughters have done virtuously. Many daughters have done well. Many women have tried. They've worked hard. They've done, had a good life. But here's the woman that God sets as the standard. Now, as we look into Scripture, we see the standard. I want to add this one point as we close. All of what I've described as a godly woman was given by this mother to her son. Her son was King Lemuel. That means she's a queen. This is a queen living this way, providing this example. That puts a whole lot more substance to it. 
None of us have that standing. But how many of us live up to that standard? There's the challenge God gives to us, not just as women, as mothers, as wives, but to us as believers. So there's the standard to compare, compare yourself to. How are we doing? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and thank you for this teaching that you've given us about godly mothers and wives. Lord, advice and teaching that they can impart to their children, but a lifestyle that gives a foundation for that teaching to be fruitful. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see principles here that apply to all of us, not just to the women, but to us as men as well, as fathers, as husbands. And so, Lord, help us to be faithful in what you've called us to. Lord, we do thank you for godly women, for the mothers that you've given us, for the wives that you've given us. I pray that you would extend a special blessing to them because of their position. Even though they operate in an attitude of submission, Lord, you will bless them and you will exalt them in your way and in your time. So help us to accept your roles for our lives that we might truly stand before you someday and receive your praise because that's the only thing that's worth receiving. Thank you again for your word. Help us not to forget it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.